Hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello. Welcome. Welcome to the green space. It's so wonderful to see you. You know me? Yeah, I was a president of Brick. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. Boy, I can't have a happy Friday because what a Friday. I mean, I can just hear my grandmother in Jamaica saying, is this kind of thing my Christian cost bad word, you know? Because this Friday, boy. But that's a whole other show. That is a whole other, Stacey Ann's gonna get into some of that. But like, okay, we're all processing still. But we are together. It's Friday and Stacey Ann is here and is the last night of her residency, which makes me incredibly excited. And she's joined by two remarkable humans, Michael Roberson, who is a public health advocate, LGBTQ plus activist, a scholar, so many things, and the remarkable Tangina Stone, who's going to give us some energy tonight with her music. So I don't have to do a lot of work here. I just need to get out of an away so that I can spend time with Stacey Ann and hear from her and eat up the good food from Cheryl's Global Soul. Hello, shout out. And I also, right, exactly, hello, Brooklyn Dale. And I want you to help me just scream a happy birthday to Ricardo Fernandez, who is our tech, our lighting director and the man that makes all of this work. Ricardo, happy birthday to you. And shout out to our Green Space team who has worked incredibly hard all week to make every night so special. So thank you for joining us. And without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Stacey Anchin. didn't come in and you hear Roe v. Wade <laughs> got overturned. Like, you feel like that? It's like, I'm all up in it. The strokes are nice. It's sexy. Like, you know, you're doing the right tone of dirty talk because it can't be too dirty because I'm a feminist. You know what I mean? Like, so you can't really say anything. So you're like, you know, just, oh my God. I remember, um, I just remember where I was when Prop 8 was like shot down. I remember where I was when I'm watching the screen, like watching George W. Bush be elected. <laughs> Do you remember where you were when Trump got elected? Yes. I know, it's one of those things. Like, you know, people throughout history were like, oh yeah, when JFK got shot, I remember where I was. You know, people, old people would be like muttering into you, you know, leaning into you. You can smell the polygrip. You know, and they're like, I remember where I was when, like, you know, um, Dr. Martin Luther King got shot. Like, people remember these moments. Um, and today, I am so grateful that you're here because there are so many important places to be this night. There are so many moments, so many places where your body is needed in protest. You know what I mean? Like, when, when Trump won, we all knew where the fuck we had to be. Everybody had to find themselves to where the protests were. We had to gather our bodies. You know, I remember my kid was just barely, you know, 216. Like, she was, like, uh, quite young and, 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 and not really, you know. I think she was still breastfeeding. I'm not sure. I have to check the length of my tit. Um, <laughs> And so, like, I'm, I'm only, the, only the people who, like, only some four people got it, like uh, the breastfeeders. Um, so, so, you know, there are places, there are moments in history when you know, I can't be home, no matter how depressed I am, no matter how cold it is outside, no matter how good it feels to lay next to the person I'm in love with tonight. No matter where, you have to get out and be with people and remember that you didn't sit down and say, oh, it's fine for them to do this, that you sat in a room where other people were saying, this shit is not right. Yeah. And twice this week, I've had to read an unfinished poem. 
And right now, this one is severely unfinished. I was actually typing at it in the back there when I, um, when I came up with it. But I was like, this can't go unanswered on a day when I'm speaking, you know? Um, so, I for so forgive me for the clumsy metaphors that have not been smoothed out yet. Forgive me for all the parts that don't quite work yet. But um, a part of being vulnerable and a part of being a part of the fight is to lend your voice even, even when it isn't eloquent. So, um, in light of the capsizing of Roe v. Wade today, in light of the commitment to those committed to undoing every scrap of progress we have achieved for anyone who isn't rich and white and male, I am again forced to gather myself, to pull my small parts together, arms and legs, <laughs> and breasts and elbows and uterus. I have to pull all that shit together to remember that the arc of the motherfucking moral universe is not just slow, but sometimes it actually backslides all the way back before it writes itself again, bends again towards justice. This is only the beginning, Clarence Thomas said. This be only the beginning of the backlash they have been planning since black people had the gall to get up from out under the atrocity of slavery. Since women had the audacity to get the right to fucking vote. Since Americans orchestrated the beauty of having a black man lead this backward ass nation out of its white male monopoly of government. I know all these things already. I hear them said among my friends every day. I know that shit the way I know that shit be fucked up in America today because it was fucked up when the land was started. It was fucked up when America became America. When America pulled itself from Britain, it was fucked up and that's why it's fucked up now. Shit be fucked up in America. I know that. But inside this paradox of the American dream, there is always the terror, the terror we have to contend with, the terror of those nightmares that trans people experience at the hands of cisgender folks, even the most well-meaning of us, both queer and straight. This argument is as old as sin, as old as the politics it was built on. This moment in history is only one more turning point. It is only a placeholder in the pages of progress, this will be remembered as the moment when we lost a little ground, when we lost a lot of ground to the hounds growling at the heels of the women who had fled captivity in search of a world where we could live louder, move more freely when we found out how the angry the establishment was when we got the right to choose, how much power they had over who we loved or who we fucked or who we did or didn't give birth to. I mean, why the fuck is it so important to these motherfuckers to be embedded in the details of what I do with my fucking uterus, what I do in my fucking bed? In another world, this might be cause for therapy for them. However, I mean, fuck. Who I fuck, when I fuck them, what happens to me or my body after we fuck, whether it's a stray sperm or a wandering egg, whether I was forced, whether I gave myself freely, whether I changed my mind, whether or whatever, whether I changed my mind back, it is still my body. It has always been my body. Even when they had the choice to do what I said no to, it was always my body. 
even when they were in charge of it, even when I was not allowed to speak against what they did, it was always my body. It is still my body. It will always be my body. It doesn't matter how many laws they change, how many things they transcribe, how many things they roll back, how many things they take away. It is still my body. It has always been my body. It will always be my body. And so whatever happens to it today or tomorrow or 100 years from now, I am committed to holding this body to the direction where I get to decide whatever I allow or don't allow is my fucking thing. Whatever I do, whatever I don't do is my fucking thing is my right to sing of sorrow or freedom. This is what Harriet Tubman fought for. This is what Angela Davis fought for. This is what Rosa Parks fought for. This is what Sojourner Truth fought for. This is what I have fought for my whole life. This is what I will fight for my whole body, my whole life. This is still my body. This will always be my body. This was always my body. It is always my body, was always my body, will always be my body. It is still my body. No matter what you do to me, it will always be my body. It has always been my body. It is my body. And I, and I, and I must choose. So, I mean, now begins another long haul. We have always um, had something, right? And um, that's one of the most wonderful things about being an activist. And if you're the right kind of activist, if you're the right kind of connected activist, you'll remember that all oppression is connected. So, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, who are they gunning for? The trans community, right? Yep. They came hard for them, right? Hard, and like we heard some grumblings and people cussed a bit and people went on and they were upset and they were upset and they were upset, right? And now they come for women and choice. And Clarence says, this is only the beginning. They are coming for the rest of us. They changed some law this week that made some idiot able to come out and conceal his gun and just be in this room with us, right? Yeah. They come in for us. And these motherfuckers can play the long game. They are good with the long game. We need to get good with the long game. That's why I have to say, Kendall, I'm so happy you're in the room. You know why? Because long after I'm dead, there will be someone fighting because you are here today in the middle of it. It's really important that we cut out this bullshit because when they sing in Jesus and they paint in Mary on the, over the, the, the clitorises of young girls in wherever the fuck Catholic county they are, like they don't say, oh, you know what? This conversation about sex is too much for like five-year-olds. They be taking that five-year-old and telling them, it's a sin to touch your body. So we got to tell our five-year-olds, it's not a sin to touch your body. We have to tell our three-year-olds, it's your decision to make whatever decision you want to make about your body, whether it's who is going to grab you by the wrist or who will eventually help you with an abortion should you need it. We have to start those conversations earlier. We have to stop this business of like, you know, this willy-nilly protecting all these babies. They are, they are far ruddier than we believe. They're stronger and we need them. We don't need to be telling young people now what's happening about abortions. We don't need to be explaining to 10-year-olds. They should know already. They should know already. You don't have to tell them like, oh, it goes up in your vagina and whatnot. People get uncomfortable with talking vagina with small babies or whatever. But, you know, you don't have to get that way. You can be like, whatever. You know, my kid, when she was one, I'd be like, okay, your choice. Your choice. So I would spend hours trying to like... 
okay, I can't grab her because I can't grab her and then tell her that it's her choice. But maybe I have to get more creative about like trying to get her to come on my side. Like, okay, it's cold outside. You can't go out there without any shoes. There are ways to negotiate. It takes more from you, but you can engage young people. Anyways, I don't want to start with a preaching. I was hoping to tell you. <laughs> I was hoping to tell you a fucking joke, but like I was, I was in the middle of, you know, I mean, um, and this audience is not white enough for me to tell like some goat joke, you know, like, you know, um, I think that, you know, sometimes you can, um, you know, get away with a light conversation, but this is not a light conversation day, right? No, it's not at all. Um, tonight we've got um, uh, Tangina Stone with us. Um, and... Uh, We've got Michael Roberson. We're going to have a, a pretty robust conversation. I, I mean, I'll tell you a little bit about them. Um, I'm not a fan of bios because once bios set up all kind of expectations, like they'd be telling you like, oh, she won this award. And, I, and then I come out here and I'm like, fuck, I got to be the person who won the award <laughs> right off the bat. Like, then it sets me up, you know, so... You can't really, like, like, okay, you can't really make a dumb joke because they're like, is this the bitch that won that award? <laughs> So, I mean, I, I like to kind of get human first. And if you like me first, then I can be like, yeah, I did win this award, you know. <laughs> but largely speaking, <laughs> I want to tell you um, that I met, um, that we were all backstage chatting a bit. And um, Tangina be like, amazing, like, future coming up. Like, I feel like if we have, like, 500 of these kinds of humans on the floor, you know, I can like take my little diaper covered vagina <laughs> and like rest easy and go towards the light. You know what I mean? Like it, it, <laughs> there's beauty in knowing that there are young people coming behind with like some fortitude and some good sense and some center, even if you don't always agree with them, uh, with, with everything they say, because you know, we're humans and we can't agree on everything. But one thing we can agree on is that we will stay in the conversation together. You know, um, and, and, and what the, I mean, you don't hear like older Christians and younger Christians. Generally, when I was in church, there was no room for you to argue with the older Christians. It, it was like, listen, Jesus says your vagina must be covered in like cement. <laughs> and I'd be like, how oh, Jesus give a shit about my vagina? I don't think, Jesus was walking around with 12 men. Chances are he did not give a shit about my vagina. He was telling these men, leave your wife and come with me. <laughs> that sounds like a Sam Smith song, you know what I mean? I'm just saying, I'm just saying, if it is, you know, I don't, I don't understand why, I mean, Jesus is not so concerned with like cancer. Like cancer of the pancreas. Why isn't like the people in church, Jesus and the rest of them, why aren't they concerned about like fibroids? They're so centered on the uterus. Yeah. Black women have more fibroids than like pubic hairs. Right. Yes. Why are they not talking about fibroids? But they're very, very, very concerned about like if in my lifetime, maybe two or three times, there might be a fertilized egg in there. What's going to happen with that egg? That's about control of labor. You know what I mean? Because human bodies, even when we're not using them, somebody got to hatch the, you know, somebody got to be laboring and, ca we, and we capitalist. Everything means that I own and then you work and then I'm, I own more. That's how it goes. So if the bodies aren't coming in, and it, you know, I mean, we're in a moment where America is short on labor. All of a sudden, Roe v. Wade turnover. I mean, the two things, I mean, I'm, I'm not so big on conspiracy theories, but I also i am a believer in things that connect. Anyways, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, young Tangina is amazing. Um, you know, I, I, I wish she, she wasn't going to sing so much, although the singing is quite nice. Uh, I, I wish we could just sit down here and talk all evening because she's so bright. And then Michael Roberson over there, I mean, the resident preacher. I don't know if you know anything about how much space this voice and politics and um, commitment and fervor takes up. Um, and I hear he mad sexy on a runway as well. <laughs> so um, I'm deeply moved and grateful to be sharing space tonight with these two 
characters because um, it feels like we can have the kind of conversation that will at least allow us to say that we aired our feelings. And at some point at the end of the conversation, we're gonna ask you to weigh in. The last time, motherfuckers be just holding on to the questions. I always say one more question, eight people hands up. <laughs> Please front forward, your, front load your questions. <laughs> Anybody have a question? No. <laughs> Cricket. All right, one more question. No, 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 no. Just, come on, black people. <laughs> Why you gotta be black in front of the four white people who are here? <laughs> You know we gotta pretend to be like flawless in order to get into these spaces. They're not gonna invite us back. They're gonna say, oh, look at these black people. They don't know how to act. They were asking lots of questions at the end and none in the beginning. So I'm asking you to front load your questions. You know. Make them in this area, front. You know what I mean? Um, so I'm going to come and join you in the audience, and um, uh, I'm gonna maybe say something else long and drawn out so that Tangina can have a little bit of prep time to know that I'm going to call you in like 15 seconds. Um, and if you're ready to rock and roll, I can get up and leave. I promise that the, I, I farted a really long time ago so the <laughs> smell has dissipated so that the, audience, the room can be yours entirely. What did I do today? I am in Jamaica. Oh, holy fuck, hold on. I must pretend to be a rock star that I don't carry my own bags. Right. Meanwhile, my child says, do you want the, 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 the crust of the bread that I've eaten everything else from? <laughs> and I used to be able to eat it because she would leave more bread on it and maybe a little bit of the filling for the sandwich. But these days she eats it right down to the brown. <laughs> and then like for a big kid like that to be offering me crust in the middle of you know, public spaces, it really stresses me out. I feel, <laughs> I feel like um, it's, a, it's a sort of disrespect. But it's hard, you know, it's like, you know, when you said yes to begin with before, she, hold on, she calling me, hold on. Zuri? Hi, Mama. I'm on stage, everybody can hear you. Say hi, audience. Hi, audience. Hi, audience. Hi. Oh, you've got Zara with you? Yeah. Oh, so you ain't need me. You made an amazing meal. Oh, you're, you made a, an amazing meal? You see? I can't see nothing, no, I'm working, what do you mean? I'm in the middle of working, and then there, you know, I'm I'm only passing the time. So say something funny. Um, talk? All right, I'm gonna go now, but like I love you, and I'll talk to you after the show, okay? Okay. Okay. Bye, audience. Bye, Bye audience. audience. That's my sign. <laughs> hey y'all. How y'all doing? You're hanging in there, say hell yeah. hell yeah. I'm hanging in there, let me let you know. Um, yes, yeah, so we had no idea that on the way over to this, this show today that um, this terrible news would be coming. Um, so we've adjusted our set a little bit because I want to talk with you more too. So yeah, we're going to do that. Um, it feels weird to sing like happy dance music right now, um, but I do want y'all to feel good and entertain you for a little bit. So y'all down for that, say hell yeah. I'm Tangina Stone. This is my amazing MD, keyboardist, background singer, JT Williams. I'm a big Stacey Ann fan, so I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you so much for being here, y'all. This first song is called Petty. Let's get right into it. Okay, we're not getting any track? Yeah, we're not getting any track. Let's start that over. Still. When we get so petty Nah, that's not it. 
again. Let me pause it. Are we good? We're getting the bass, but we're not getting the track. Okay, that's a little better. Okay, that's doable. I'll send it over. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Y'all would it still say hell yeah? <laughs> still need more track though. When we get so petty, how we start this fight? Sorry. It's when I guess you're right. One day we'll get crazy, babe. This was really terrible. right off the ground so when you angry and you say you can't stand me go away but only in the other room until the love and can resume so petty, how we start this fight you just blame me nowadays but i guess you're right one day we'll get raised babe then the grace turn So a weird start there. <laughs> Thank y'all for holding it down. What we hear up here versus what y'all hear out there is very different. Um, <laughs> and I feel like you kind of missed the whole concept of the song, but it's okay, we're gonna move along. That song was called Petty. I hope you have fun with it. <laughs> this next song is called Fanta. This is also a song that would be great to have a clap with y'all. Um, this is just a fun one about getting out of shitty relationships and moving on with your life. Say hell yeah. Happy Pride, by the way. <laughs> Happy Pride. So it's about that. Yeah, let's have fun. Let's do it.
Getting in my sunshine now from East Atlanta. Hold it down. Everything I need off in this world. No more nights waiting for you at 4 a.m. Rendezvous like you ain't my girl. Hey, nail tough, that's what you love about me, ain't it? I'm done with repeats in myself. You can keep your round trip out to San Marina. All I wanted back then was for you to talk to me. Take me up. Fall asleep in my head. Talk to me. y'all sounded y'all held it down thank you so much <laughs> this next song is called money um yeah this next song is called money it might be it's pretty self-explanatory i was mad around the protest um at the top of the pandemic pissed off and i was mad at um white people treating black folks like revenue streams but not like human beings so this song came from that let's get it I'ma buy black, buy the block back 
such a strange thing be damned if money ever changed me forget money so my fam don't live funny no this world ain't designed right for me and i hate that we live for money some people who kill for money in our blood and bones there's money before we're humans, we're there. Dollar, dollar, dollar bill, y'all. Yeah, dollar, dollar, dollar bill, y'all. Yeah, twenty, twenty dollar bill, y'all. Yeah, twenty, twenty dollar bill, y'all. Yeah, money, money, money. We're there, money. Money, we're there. Money, 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 we're there. Money, 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 we're there. Money, and I hate that we live for money. Some people will kill for money. In our blood and bones, there's money. Before we're humans, we're their money. Thank you. More. We got one more for y'all. It's actually called More. That was a really terrible joke. Really terrible. Y'all even y'all y'all been holding it down. Left me out. <laughs> this next song is called More. Um, it's actually inspired by my partner who taught me the importance of embracing um, more, wanting more. We always deserve more of what we need, what we want, um, and going after that. So, yeah, it's called more. Let's get it. Oh, one more time from the top. <laughs> Same thing. Is that us thing? Just what I am and what I want is more, 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 more. Don't keep me waiting, don't question what I am giving and taking and who I'm beside. I want more, 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 more. I love myself like la la la. I'm one of those people who knows I need more, 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 more. I saw, I saw, I saw you rolling up in my dream. Call you my dream, girl. It's a dream world every second. At times, of course, I got to reckon with, yeah. I love myself like la la la, la la la. Spend what I got, throw it up, throw it up. I'm never gonna wait around. I'll see you on the way down. I love myself like la la la, la la la. Spend what I got, throw it up, throw it up. I'm never gonna wait. Shifting my thinking, what whiskey I'm drinking. Kiki, she love me in town for the weekend. We're having some fun, let's call it self-care. I'm leaving the fuckery all over there. Don't keep me waiting, don't question what I am giving and taking. And who I'm beside, I need more, more, more. 
myself like la la la, la la la. Spin what I got, throw it up, throw it up. I'm never gonna wait around. I'll see you on the way down. Because I love myself like la la la, la la la. Spin what I got, throw it up, throw it up. Thank you so much. Clap for yourselves. Shout out to JT over here. Y'all see how many things this man is doing? The pride events I pulled him out to, he'd be out here. Thank you. <laughs> Am I good to turn this off? Invite Michael to join us. Michael Roberson, everybody just act like. You gotta act like it's Mike. It's, uh, it, no, I said Michael Jackson the other night, but then some people, <laughs> some people hauled me over. So like, just act like it's Janet Jackson. That's it. That is happening. Yeah. Quite the compliment. <laughs> um, so here we are again. I mean, I don't even know what to talk about because we were talking about home and uh, what came out of the last conversation with um, Mo Brown and Candice Hoyas is um, we were forced to begin the conversation on the stage about um, whether people of color can call America home. Mm -hmm. And um, post the pandemic, you know, that song where you uh, talked about, you know, before we're human beings, we are their money. Yeah. Um, of course, it's a part of the larger conversation, and I want to invite both of you as you know, um, you know, people who are queer, and people who I that's my eye drop. <laughs> so <laughs> if I have, you know, I can't turn it off or else I'll forget the other nights. <laughs> so I just wait until it comes on and then I do it. Yeah, I I, I feel you. <laughs> this is life. Um, so I want to I want to invite you both to maybe begin with the question of, uh, in light of today's uh, happenings, in light of where we are in this moment, in light of uh, uh, how we saw things play out with the Black Lives Matter movement, in light of um, how we saw people of color being treated and people's, people of color, their plight throughout the pandemic, and then today. Um, how do y'all feel about the U.S. of A. as home. Mm. You can go for it. You go ahead. Are you sure? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, first, I have to say um, I'm fanning out. Be real clear. Going to be sitting next to this woman. Yeah. I said this in the Same. back. I'm, right? I'm fanning out. Same. You know, um, I'm from the Baldwin community, and what we would call her is an absolute icon, right? Yeah. Come on, let's be real clear. An absolute icon, Thanks. the very definition of dynamic, the Thanks. very ancestry required for freedom. So I am very privileged to be here with you. So that's number one. Deeply grateful. <laughs> the, the gratitude runs both ways. And I'm just, these shoes are, I'm just, <laughs> there, yeah, I'm yeah. trying to look away. I can't see the details, <laughs> but. When people be saying like, something nice to you, you're trying to like, you know, get all <laughs> humble and like look away. And I'm like seeing these shoes, I'm like, what the yeah, Thank they, you. Y'all don't understand Thank what they're you. giving. 
Um, you know, but I was to your wonderful the, the the question you posed earlier. I was I got home earlier today, and I'm an MSNBC junkie. So I was watching. I was uh, on a Zoom call, and I turned it on, and I could not believe, you know, what would across the screen. Even though we had been warned it was Even coming. Even though we had been warned, right? And so there is this 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 sort of knee-jerk reaction of uh, here we go again. You know, as an as an ontologically both black and gay man, here we go again. Um, and then at the same time there is a beautiful moment when the universe illuminates that in which you're supposed to see. I, I, we were having this conversation in the back that for, for, you know, years ago when Barack Obama became president, we believed, we were told that we lived in a post-racial post society. And then Trump happens, right? And uh, Trump emboldened this notion of white supremacy and patriarchal formation mm -hmm. to say it out loud, no longer have to, 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 to whisper it. And so in that space, it was one of those moments. Here we go again, and yet, and yet, we needed to know, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think we're at a space where you're beginning to see intersections of community organizing to, 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 to begin to address some of the things that I think that are impacting where we're at today in this country. But to your other point, are people of color, though? This is the USA home for people of color. It is an absolute question I think that we've historically wrestled with, okay. that we're gonna to have to continue to wrestle with. That W.E.B. Yeah. Du Bois yeah, yeah, yeah. started, you know, um, decades and decades yeah. ago when, we, you know, he talked about this, um, this double black consciousness, consciousness. that um, uh, black people in America have to live with. And then you throw in a little bit of queer in it and mm. all of a sudden, we got triple consciousness. Yeah. You, um, you know, throw a little immigrant in it. Like, yeah. you know, you, you, know you, you throw a trans identity on top of that. And then, you know, you're just like Sybil, fractured, <laughs> different personalities trying to like code switch, you know, 15, 20 times a day. Um, what about you? How are you feeling over there? Like, you know, you, I mean, I'm almost dead because I'm like, yeah, you know, not good. 50 um, and thing. <laughs> <laughs> you just start in life and shit. I think that for me, um, the question of like, can we ever feel home here? I think that I've been really wrestling with the idea that we may all, in my lifetime, that I, I may always feel displaced. Yeah. I don't know that mm. like, I'll see the end of this war on our bodies in my lifetime. Mm. And I think that that is, um, it's really hard to embrace, mm. it's really hard to embrace the idea that we can do so much work right now um, and that we still may not see it, you know? Mm. But I still, but it's important nonetheless. We were talking a lot earlier about intergenerational um, connections and how important that it is that we continue these conversations, no matter like our age differences. Like it's really, really important to continue that. Um, you talked a lot about your grandmother. I mean, yes, absolutely. Uh, in the back there, I just would say that you know this young woman was. <laughs> am I misgendering you, woman? No, no. You're right. um, you know, I. Um, she was saying. I can't wait to talk to my grandmother about this. Mm -hmm. And I can't say that I've ever heard anyone say, you know, like, oh my God, they just made abortion illegal. I can't wait to get to my grandmother so we could talk about this, which was um, astounding to hear mm -hmm. about one, someone who was your age, yeah. reaching first for your grandmother in a moment of um, political trauma, you yeah. know, of, of you know, an activist trauma, but also um, for a woman her age, to be the sounding board for something about progress in this way. It was astoundingly beautiful to hear it. Thank you. I think um, it's really like my grandmother's, I was raised by an entire line of matriarchs. Um, my great, great grandmother was alive until I was like 13 or 14. So I was raised by a whole line of them and I think that they always remind, when I, when I need hope, you know, like, like I was just saying, I've been like wrestling with that question since reading the news. Um, will I always feel displaced? Will this like war against our bodies, our minds, our rights, our rights being up for grabs, like will it ever end in my lifetime? And there's this feeling of hopelessness that can come with that. And I think to your point earlier when you were talking about um, our generation's shock at Trump and you're like, well, we knew like, hey, we've had Bush, you know, some have had Reagan, like we, and I think talking to my grandmother and my great grandmother, um, A, knowing that they're on my side, that they wanna see me, you know, live my life in a way that feels 
free and in a way that is liberated. They want to see that for me. Mm -hmm. And they're very angry that I haven't yet. But I think talking to them, um, it gives me hope because they've saw this happen so many times, you know, throughout their lifetimes. Um, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's funny that you, um, you mentioned that, um, that your, your grandparents, yeah. your great grandparents and your grandparents are mm -hmm. on your side. On my side. You know, historically speaking for LGBT people of yeah. color, particularly young people, there has been the conversation yes. that if your, if your family is not, you know, if they're not tap dancing and wearing chaps when you come out to them, <laughs> it means that they yeah. are completely uh, on you know, against you, that they become your adversaries. Mm -hmm. You should be removed from your space with them. And um, I've been pushing at this, pushing back at this for decades because I believe that you know when when you're queer and you're of color that you have many parts of you that need nurturing. And I want to throw it back to you. I mean, you have dealt with young uh, queer people, particularly um, young uh, gay men, right? You know, in, in the work that you've done, yeah. um, and many of them, you know, uh, have been kicked out of homes and sent out, and they have formed uh, relationships with white organizations or people in organizations that have been traditionally white who have encouraged mm. them away from their families. Mm. And then we've also seen mm. years mm. after when those young people are in their 20s and, okay. you know, and are no longer a part of the organization's uh, priority, then they then are without family at all. Uh, which becomes, you know, I, I've, I always advocate for some relationship with the family. I want to have you speak a little bit more about that with regard to homelessness and home, homing and housing and belonging and family. It, so it's, there's a couple of things. One, I can point to these wonderful folk here. First of all, let me be real clear that this man here is one of my absolute dearest best friends. It is who it is his shoulders that I stand on mm. from Philadelphia because he was the first one that I saw witness while I'm in the ballroom community to, to do community organizing mm -hmm. in a particular kind of way that took ballroom out of sort of just a notion of performativity. Um, and so I stand on his shoulder. Um, so, can, so can, you, can you say his name so that people who are out <laughs> in the world? <laughs> Kwame Banks. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Absolutely. And so there's two things real quick to that which is, I come from a community that has been ostracized out of what we call home in black community, mm -hmm. that was created during the Harlem Renaissance through the ethos of black trans women. And so the question became, what does it mean for black folk to move to Harlem from the southern part of the United States to be homeless now, black LGBT folk to be homeless down in the new home? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so black trans women created a, a, what I call both a theological political movement that we call ballroom. And so I come from that, and the creation of kinship structures have saved lives. So that's number one. But number two, the other piece around homelessness and even around political movement, I'm wondering, to your point, um, are we going to learn the lesson differently? Who do we privilege in this moment now? So what do I mean by that? The thing about COVID um, and the universe having us to take a global pause all at one time, it is only because of that that we paid that much attention to George Floyd. But mm -hmm. even in that moment, even in that pause, we didn't, that six days later, we didn't pause enough to know that the black trans woman in the same city named Ayanna Dior was beat and brutalized by 40 people, beat out of a store. And then she somehow had a historical wherewithal to say that I'm going to push myself back in the store while I'm getting beaten. And so that it can be filmed on camera because if I'm going to die, the world over is going to know the same as Emmett Till's mother. Mm -hmm. right? So the question for, for in this moment is that are black trans women or, or, or are black queer people going to be pushed out of this thing called home and black community during this moment? I mean, it, it, it is a, a valid, important, and urgent question because um, those of us who've been in the movement yeah. a long time, and perhaps even those who study it now, mm -hmm. are quite aware that the most vulnerable yeah. are always yeah. carrying the heaviest burden yeah. of any movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about climate change and you talk about, I mean, you talk about homelessness and, you know, people moving, you talk about entire village communities that are unable to eat, people who have never participated in the formal economy the way it exists now in cities, who have always been able to feed themselves and take care of themselves generally are now, because of climate change, unable to grow their food, 
unable to feed their children, unable to live safely if they're living near the sea. There are a bunch of ways. And, and so when you talk about the homeless, you know, kind of trans women, particularly of color trans yeah. women, particularly black yes. trans women, we know that these people are sometimes the most vulnerable in almost any community. And so they pay the highest price. And the question for us who have some power, and when I say some power, I mean mm. those of us who are allowed to sit upon stage, right. and those of us who have fans, and those of us who have yeah. room to speak, and those of us who are paid to speak, what is our responsibility right. in calling that to the forefront of the conversation? What is our responsibility to make that the center of the dialogue, to pull the people who are pushed to the, mm -hmm. the, the edge to make them the center? How do we move the whole fucking table right. so the discussion isn't happening over That's here right. where the table is big and fluffy, right. but perhaps That's on the right. edge of the yeah. conversation That's where right. there's no table? Yeah. That's right. You know? That's yeah. Right. And I, 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 I want to ask you coming up, you know, mm -hmm. you are... Um, a generation behind me. Mm -hmm. How do you feel that has been um, a part of the conversation now for young people? How do we, uh, you know, um, you know, I, 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 my partner is a, is a, is also a millennial, and mm -hmm. so we, we, we have conversations, and I'm always like, oh, y'all millennials, and she's like, yeah. why y'all talk about these millennials yeah. all this much? <laughs> but I, I wanna, I wanna say, like, sometimes I hear that we've perfected, you know, where we are presently in the movement, we've perfected the art of sounding as if we are concerned, mm. as if we mm. know, <laughs> we understand, as if we are on your side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in many ways, the same happenings mm. that used to take place 20, 30, 50, 70, 80 years ago are still happening where only the people who are light-skinned, mm -hmm. the people who are uh, well-spoken, the people who able speak body. English, the people who are able-bodied, mm -hmm. the people yeah. who are thin, only those people are on stage and get to take up That's space. Yeah. What do you think? What can you say about how it is that 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 um, that kind of dual uh, experience is happening in your generation in the in the activist movement in the performance artist movement? I think that um, so much of it begins with interrogating ourselves mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. We were talking in the back about like just. I was telling you how sometimes with my grandmothers that I have to like keep my feelings in check and like hear them um, and understand the things that have shaped their experiences and their perspectives. And I think what makes me feel all the time like they're on my side is that they're willing to interrogate themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is like the cue that I've taken from them. So I interrogate everything I think. I have to all the time remember that I live in a uh, a country that has been shaped by white supremacy, designed to make us dislike each other, to harm each other, mm -hmm. understanding that um, all these systems that we're pushing back against, we weren't actually supposed to figure out. It was supposed to just work. Yeah, Audrey Lorde said yeah. we weren't meant to survive. We weren't. We weren't you meant know, the to survive. Was not they for meant us. to leave us for dead. And so mm -hmm. understanding that, um, remembering that all the time, um, and being willing to interrogate myself at every turn, to interrogate myself and you know, how much space am I taking up here? Um, I think just being really to sit with the things that are uh, that can be uncomfortable. Not everything that's uncomfortable is bad. Mm. Those things like propel us to grow. Mm. So I think just that's that's kind of like how I navigate everything in my life. I used to walk into situations feeling like self-righteous, you know, in the activist community, like, oh yeah, I know all the answers. Like the new Christian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used to walk into spaces feeling that way. Um, and then going into this state of perpetual burnout and then experiencing COVID and being at home for the first time and writing that song Money when I was really angry and just freestyling it and letting it come out. And it was like, yo, who am I now? Now that I've really had the time to become me, who am I now? Who do I, who do I actually want to be mm -hmm. now that I have the time to work on that? Um, because I think that that's also by design. I haven't had the time to really become who I'm meant to be because I've been burned the hell out. So I think um, thinking about that, thinking about the compassion that I want from people all the time, um, being able to actually give that as well, and, and really just thinking about how I'm showing up in the world and accepting that sometimes I won't do it fucking right and being able to be accountable when that happens. You for, know? Sh for sure. Um, I, I also want to maybe, before I pull the audience in, I want to ask you both a, two, a two-part question. What do you think the mandate for the LGBT uh, agenda? What do you think that is now? What, what, what do you think? You know, there was a time when I was young when everyone was uh, uh, 
you know, kind of gunning for the right to marry. Mm -hmm. And um, we all thought that when we got that, that it would be like, great. <laughs> you know, and all of us would just, you know, you know, get right all of under the one. rainbow. Right, 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 right. <laughs> and um, and um, but I want to ask you, what do you think the what do you think the, the the agenda is for the LGBT community now? Mm. Um, and uh, the second part of the question is, what would you ask of the generation? Pick one ahead of you or behind you mm. now in this moment. Mm. So, what would you yeah. ask of the generation if you could have them all lined up in front of you and you were just you you had you you had one wish for them, one ask? What would it be? My ask would be... To my what generation? To what generation? To which generation? Which one are you addressing the ask to? Are you asking... I, are you a Gen Zer? No, millennial. Okay. Would, what would you ask of the Gen Zers? What would you yeah. ask of the Xers or the... Like, what... what you know, if we're, if we're having this intergenerational reach and ask, yeah. what would you ask for from what generation? I, I would ask Gen Z... Um, I think that we're really caught up right now in everything being um, correct, everything being done right in cancel culture, right? Um, and I've just been experiencing lately the ways that our own community discards folks within it. And that feels so harmful to see. Um, and I think that a lot of the reason why that is happening is that none of us are willing to expand for each other. We're not willing to do that for each other because we didn't learn to do that for ourselves. And so I think that it's, real, it's just an important, it's like my favorite check-in every single day when I get mad, when I'm upset. Am I being expansive right now? Mm -hmm. Am I actually being expansive in this situation? Am I, am I doing my best? So I think that that's what I would ask um, Gen Z. Are you being expansive right now? Or are you just canceling people on Twitter? Mm. All right. Are you actually considering the things that have shaped this person's experiences and why they might feel what, how they feel? Mm. You know? Th you know, that's such an interesting... Um observation in that like um, our ability to step outside of who we are and to step into the reality or the experiences I mean old people used to say walk a mile in my shoe yeah. <laughs> I mean it's the same philosophy mm -hmm. but it stands uh, it holds true still yeah. that people are asking you can you see who I am can you can you spend a moment in my skin so perhaps you won't be so angry, so dismissive of me when you see me mm. fucking up, you mm. know? Um, one of the things with, um, one of the things that I've learned, I mean, sometimes to the detriment in black communities, particularly in Jamaican communities, is that we don't, we don't dis dis discard nobody. I mean, no matter, some of these people should be discarded. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus knows, heaven knows, hallelujah, Audrey, Lord, if you have a moment, take a moment here. Like, some people should be discarded, but w we can learn from a culture that does not discard. Yes. Redemption can be found in yeah. everyone. Yeah. There's always one more opportunity for redemption to, you know, collective rare healing its head. is collective. what I th collect our collective healing, and that's like what is at stake here: our ability to do that. Can we actually do that? I think that we. I can. I mean, I think we, we have no choice. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we, you know, the the we're hurtling towards, you know extinction if we just keep canceling and killing each other and now that we can carry a gun in new york city god fucking yes, help us yeah. passing the All mic to us. you in this very tender moment <sighs> so mine is two part it would be the generation mm -hmm. um after me one would be i love your notion of interrogation self-interrogation socratic energy it would be to be socratic enough to push back one internalizes this notion of abomination. That to be able to sit in the mirror and see God looking back at you, right? To know that you are fully human and fully divine and you don't need anyone's permission to say so. So that's one. The second one would be to young black gay men. To do the same thing, to interrogate and not make the mistake that we did, which was our inability or our disability to push back on our misogyny and patriarchy. Somehow black gay men think because we're black and gay, it eradicates us from being patriarchal. Mm. And black gay men have been heavily patriarchal, mm. and in that, even in LGBT community, to particularly black lesbians, and specifically for black trans women. Mm -hmm. So it would be those two things. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah, that's a word. Yes, a whole word. Um, <laughs> you know, and I, I think I want to open the, the floor to, to those of you who have questions, and I did 
warn y'all motherfuckers in the beginning <laughs> to get your questions she ready. Did. She did. So that you would be ready. So had I see you. I hope you have a question. Um, so I, you know, I, I want to invite people who have questions or comments um, to share. Look at you on <laughs> it. Yes. <laughs> Um, hi. 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 <laughs> um, so, Tangia, am, am I saying your name right? Tangina. 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 Yeah, very close. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so, earlier in the conversation, you brought up how you spoke with your grandmothers about, how do I phrase it, kind of having hope for the future because you can have like a time machine to understand the, the tribulations that they've gone through. And I guess my question would be, how do you kind of think long term? Mm. How do you think, how do you find the skills mm. to think long term, to have that kind of strength, I guess, is what I'm asking for everyone. I'll give you like my honest, very transparent answer on what has worked for me. And I'm not sure if this will work for anybody else, but um, I, t I just talked to someone recently about sustainability. Um, and I think like talking to my grandmothers, two generations of them definitely has helped me like put that into perspective, how to sustain myself. And I think um, during the pandemic, I really sat and like drew a sustainability wheel. We apply that concept to so many things, the environment, the economy, not our bodies. Um, we've been taught to leave those behind for some reason, our mental health, um, our everything, we've been taught to just leave those things behind. And I realized that um, I just being fully transparent, I experienced some, t some times where I felt suicidal. And I was like, hmm, I don't think I'm living my life in a way that is sustainable for me right now. So let's figure out what that looks like. Um, and really being serious about what I needed to sustain myself. It meant like making, making new friends that actually bring me a lot of joy being around people who are, who cherish me too, you know, feeling loved all the time, less white people in my life. That was a really big one for me, <laughs> having a cap on that. Um, really drawing and writing that shit out for yourself. What is What makes your life sustainable? What are the things that make you feel really good? It's okay to center and prioritize that, mm -hmm. even in a society that has told you that you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's what I've done. And I find it very helpful. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned the community piece because um, I could not be an activist in the way that I have been for 25 years um, without like a strong, ongoing community of folks. I mean, how long have I known you? <laughs> <laughs> I ain't seen you in like about 20 years. I haven't seen you in forever, but the years that we spent together, like building community in Brooklyn, yes, like yeah. every Saturday night, lesbian party at 919 <laughs> Park Place, apartment 4B. <laughs> like, oh, we, we, we didn't really see each other very Still much parties? outside of that, but we saw each other every Saturday night at a party that I held at my apartment. Are there still parties, there, lesbian mm, parties? No, <laughs> not, not right now because I'm in Brooklyn, but there are Asking parties at a place called Kindred on the Rock in oh, Jamaica. Yeah, I'll, I'll be there. Where if you come, Kindred on the Rock, you should follow it. It's an intentional uh, community, a 70-acre farm in Jamaica that I have just started. And I have people, you know, all the gay men can come and be half naked on the land. <laughs> and all the lesbians can come and be in full, like, safari gear. Um, and the people in between who could just be like safari on the top and naked on the bottom. We are, That's, there we we're go. Absolutely like welcoming of all the ways that you can be and all the ways that you can represent who you are. Um, you know, I have a strong uh, argument uh, for like um, the, the, the presence of white people in the movement. Mm -hmm. um, we need white people to show up in so many ways that black people, it would be too dangerous for us to show up in oh, that yeah. way. 
So I think I agree that, that, you know, during those lives with the Black Lives Matter, you know, we had to put like, I remember when we were marching, we had to put white bodies on the outer right. perimeter of the crowd because you know that in a lot of ways, they, the, the cops would have to answer louder That's questions right. to against the, the brutality of white bodies. And so there are ways. I mean, I used to be a long time ago be like, these white people... They come to my show, they buy a ticket and go to fuck home. I don't want to talk to you. And I cuss them out all the time. But I understand that just like we need men in the That's feminist up. movement, yeah, just like we need cis people, um, you know, uh, standing between the cops and trans bodies, j there, there are ways in which privilege right. can That's be right. employed right. in the fight against right. injustice, in the fight against oppression. Yeah. And there are ways, I mean... And, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's, it's pleasant because we be like on, you know, we be, we hate the whole white systemic shit that you have going on. And so we got to fucking like unload on you all the time. But we need for you not to be fragile. Yeah. If you need to weep, go find your people, make some watercress sandwich with, with them and like weep with them. Like, just like when I need to fucking go over to these black people, I be weeping with them and be like, these fucking white people, you, you can find your tribe and release, and, but, but you are necessary in the fight. You cannot be on the sidelines. You cannot be on the sidelines. I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying. And that's, see, for context, I'm saying close personal relationships with white people who I have to educate all the time. But what yeah. I'm saying isn't isn't a isn't a isn't a push back against yeah, you. Yeah. It's really just an, a, a reinterpretation of what it is that I do. Yeah. You know, and I feel like I agree with you. All, with I feel all like it. the world is set up to protect you. The world is set up to funnel resources in your mm. hand. What I need for you to do is buy some pads, some <laughs> sanitary napkins and some tampons and some pencils so I can give them to the poor people in the community around Kindred, Kindred on the Rock so that they can go to school so that they can have you know, tampons and pads because we don't have the resources. Our community doesn't necessarily have the resources. Don't be ashamed of the privilege that you have motherfucking use, use it, it to level the playing field. That's a word. <laughs> I am sick and tired of like, oh my God, I'm so, I feel so bad, I feel so bad. And then you take all your fucking millions and you go home. <laughs> I don't want you to feel bad and go home. I want you to feel bad and stay here and change some shit with me. Use that privilege that you have, you have, you have understood to be present to do some good outside of just articulating it yeah 100%. next question <laughs> i love it oh my god great kendall <laughs> hi um i don't really have a question i i have question i have like something that like happened which is like mostly like about like how like i don't know so i had this one friend who was white she's not my friend anymore but um i was like talking about race me and my friend were talking about racism and in, in, like a group right and she started trying to change the topic and like started saying, you know, guys, I feel really uncomfortable in this situation right now. And then we were like, you know, that doesn't matter. This is a real problem that is happening right now and it's still Come happening. On Come on. So, and then she was like, yeah, but like, do you want to hear me play my flute? And I was just like. <laughs> <laughs> No. I can't even tell you how amazingly <laughs> symbolic and illuminating that story is. Just on the flute shit. Yeah. <laughs> Let's play a flute. Let's go. The only thing she could have said that was worse is if she had said, let me break dance for you. Yeah. Like, I mean, but the flute was just like perfect. And, I, you know, I, and, and now she's no longer your friend? Yeah, no. Oh, no. Good job. No. Look at you. That's how I know, Absolutely you know, you, you, you're, you're going to save us. You're going to save us. <laughs> Next one. So good. So good. Um, so my question is for Stacey Ann. I know that um, with Kindred on the Rock, I'm wondering how, what your perspective is on creating home um, and what home means to you now that you have home both, or you've created home both in... Um, in the U.S. and in Brooklyn specifically, and also in Jamaica, and, and how that um, has evolved for you? You know, um, 
one of the things you begin to know very clearly as you get older is how much you don't know. Mm. You know, when I was young, I used to think I know so much. I knew everything. And then at the sight of my first gray pubic hairs, <laughs> I knew that there were things I did not know. <laughs> and that they would be shocking. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and that they would inform how I think of myself. And that was the beginning of a greater knowing that every year as you get older, every time you come into a new identity, every time you change something about yourself, that there would be new knowings coming your way. Yeah. And so I, for a long time, I struggled like a motherfucker trying to find a way, make a home in Brooklyn. And as soon as I bought a house, when I felt secure enough that, oh my goodness, I bought a house in Brooklyn, and you, some of you watched me online tear up floorboards and put new walls in and put a roof in and there was no sewer in the house. Like, so for three weeks we were using the bathroom until three weeks it backed up and somebody's like, oh my God, I brought the plumber and he's like, you don't have a sewer, it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> All of it is just like somewhere below your house. Mm. I know, it's like the mm. kind of thing that you live for. You can't write this. You know, if you wrote it, they'd be like, this is too much, it doesn't really happen, but it does happen. $26,000 later, we have a new sewage. However, I struggled very, very hard to get a home. And as soon as I got my house, as soon as I settled in, I was like, okay, as soon as I pay this mortgage every month that I would be safe and I would have a home in Brooklyn. I got the yen. Then the pandemic came and then I got the yen to go to Jamaica. And then I got the urge and the opportunity to buy a farm mm. and then i started like one bit by bit one day we're like okay we need a we need some chicken so we got some chickens and we put some chickens in a corner of the farm and then we were like oh every time you go to the down to the chickens the your feet are all muddy we need some a concrete you know you know some steps going down there some little you know i don't know pathways or something and then you're like you know what let's just make it accessible and then you made it accessible and then you're like, oh, you should pull out all these trees around here and make it sort of a park. And then it, it just evolves and it, you, you know, you're making it and you're making it. I say all of that to say that there isn't so much this specific conscious movement. Mm. What I do is I leave myself open to things happening. Mm -hmm. and, um, and for a long time, I think I didn't because I had this specific plan that was going to happen, that life was going to happen this way. And I was pushing and pushing and pushing against the universe. And I was like, there's no fucking universe. The, you know, the universe has forgotten black people. Fuck your universe, you know. <laughs> but, Been but, there. But I'm now at this place where I understand that life will prevent, present you with choices. And that you just make the ones that feel good in the moment. And if you change your mind, you change your mind. And you change directions. But you have to leave room for surprises. Because if you don't, you won't ever be surprised. You know what I mean? Love from love to home to, you know, I mean, just on some like, okay, if you decide, if I like somebody and I decide that that person don't like me, the thing done, it's shut down, party done, party over. <laughs> However, if I allow myself to sweat through the discomfort of not yeah, knowing whether she that's likes that's me that's and I go anyways and I leave myself open, maybe, that's just that's maybe she'll like me or maybe she'll say something and maybe I'll get some. You know what I mean? <laughs> But you're not going to get none if you decide that's that right. that's not an option. So just like how you figure out home, I, I, I know that, like, I know that the, the earth did not create these borders for us. Mm. Yeah, right. And so right. these artificial borders created by these governments that of mostly men, of mostly money, of mostly privilege, these people have no idea how it is that human beings connect and move across borders. These borders mean fucking nothing outside of getting across them. Mm -hmm. On the other side of that border, there are people who could be tribe. There are people who could be kindred. There are people who would willingly open their homes and their hearts to you and for you to open yourself and become something that you never thought you could become. I'm saying leave a little room for the universe to surprise you. Yes. 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 That was amazing. Like, what do you 
want me to say know. after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, now you're here. Okay, a um, couple of things. First, as you said earlier about bios, see, after Mike said all that stuff about me, I normally don't like to say anything because now I have to sound like I have some sense because he gave me a little build up. <laughs> um, and he's also, so I'm a filmmaker by trade. And people will know me, Mike's that cousin that's always going to call you the government name that he knows. <laughs> but um, I, I normally use my Yoruba name, Odu. So you, there was something really poignant. And first, I wanted to just compliment the richness of it, to sit in a room and the variance of age, the variance of gender identity, sexuality, ethnicity, complexion, hair, et cetera. Because I don't think we honor that when we experience it. And I think it leads to then, when we see these changes, is because we, ha we do live in differentiation. Like, that's our joy. It's, well, I'm this, and you're that, and I'm da, 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 da. But specifically looking at Roe versus Wade and thinking about feminism and movement and every woman I know telling me it's not a man, it's my body. I know it's your body, honey, but it's my body. But at the same time, it's the collective mind that makes the change. So how do we, and this is a question, yeah, I had it together, but you said all that other stuff, now I messed up here. Collective template. How do we start to have a dialogue or template a dialogue where we come together in honesty of our differentiation and authenticity of it, not trying to act like I understand you and all that, and do the hard work. And I know y'all have done that in some experiences, because I think that's the conversations or some of the conversations we need to have now so that we actually do it. Does that make you? Know yes, you okay. want to take a sh shot at it? <laughs> really? <laughs> um, so, Odu, <laughs> me and him have been friends for so long and we do this back and forth. You know, I, I, I the beauty, and I keep invoicing the House Ball Ballroom community for this particular reason. Because in the US context, it is black and Latinx and LGBT, right? Which means that every health disparity that impacts black folk converges on this community. Mm -hmm. And every health disparity impacts Latinos. And then women and black women and Latin women all in this one community converging, convening at the same time. And still somehow it continues to mobilize, to, to uh, mobilize over and against these sort of intersections of health disparities. And, I, and so I think it's a model, I really do. I have this notion, we did this wonderful thing at the Whitney Biennial, and I have this notion that ballroom has something to say to teach the world over about what it really means to be human in the struggle for freedom for, in, in the face of catastrophe. One, because it is always on intimate terms with death all day, every day. It does, it's not dodging, it is, right? And two, because of its demographic uh, makeup. So that, 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 so that when, it, when, when, when we are engaging in discourse, it, 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 it's, it, it's, an, it's engaging in a discourse that's multidimensional, intersectional. That's number one. But number two, I wanted to say something that you had to have a question. Now that went out of my mind. This is the thing about getting older, right? Um, but you had said something. Da, 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 da. It was this thing about home that you had said that I think that was so in, to that piece, right? Home. And so for, for, for to your point, that the intentionality for this community to create home, right? In, 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 in the face of always feeling not not a part, right? Always feeling homeless, being on the marginal. Somehow, hmm, that's what I want. You, you, you asked the question about sustainability. Two things for me. The greatest blessing in my life was to be born through the womb of a black woman that I called my mother. Absolutely the greatest blessing. Because it was in that womb that the very first conversation the universe had with me. To tell me who I was in the planet and in the very DNA of myself, so that when I came out in the world, and the world told me very differently about who I was. It stood up and said, don't believe that lie. This is a true story. My construction of my cosmology when I was younger was my mother, God, then Jesus. Ergo, for me, black women, God, then Jesus. And so people have asked me, as I got older, has that changed? I said, no, absolutely not. Black women have been that home for me. Always, always, and I'm always have, I always desire to honor that because it's the absolute truth. So that's number one. Mm. The, the last thing I say about that, and to that point, the other thing is to remind myself, I'm old enough to know, to remind myself what it, me what it means 
to be the descendant of slaves, of descendants of black folk, right? The ontology of blackness. That in 1619, you, woke, you went to sleep a slave and woke up and did that for 365 days and for another year, for another year, for another decade, and for, them, and for 200 and some odd years. Now, how does a people have the social imagination to know what freedom was if they never experienced it? Right. So that is what sustains mm -hmm. me. You know, um, uh, I think we're nearing closing, um, but I, I want to thank you so much for that. Um, I want to invite the audience to imagine with me if all the barriers of geography and uh, money, and uh, who do you think you where do you think you belong? All of those questions were removed, and I think it's such a, a beautiful segue into how do people who have never seen the freedom that they yearn for how do they have an imagination to construct it, much less to attempt to describe it to people who they might be asking for this freedom, you know? Um, and so I'm inviting you t when you leave here tonight. I'm daring you, I'm challenging you to go home to wherever you're resting tonight and to take a page from your book, you know, whether it's your whatever, and and write down a description of the home you would choose mm. if you could. Mm. What would that home look like? What would it smell like? What would be the parameters of it? Who would inhabit it? What would you do with them? Sometimes our ability to grasp a thing, our ability to come into it as a reality, our ability to reach a thing that we are pushing for begins with our ability to craft it in our minds. Um, you know, I, I, I am deeply grateful for this week that I have lived inside mm. of the questions of home what is it? Where is it? And I imagine a world where people would be able to get up and decide that this place will be home for me for one year. Uh, I invite you from this day, from today, the 24th of June, on the day that they have decided that women do not have a choice when it comes to mothering or not mothering, mm -hmm. I ask you to deliberately, to intentionally, to build the business of community. You know, community is not something that is convenient. Sometimes you have to take the train to Harlem to see a friend. Sometimes you have to decide that I'm too tired, but I'm going to see this person anyways. All those years when I had those parties every Saturday night, I learned really quickly, really early, that the way to keep those women coming back and to press that friendship into forever is to deliver mm. on the consistency of friendship. Mm. And New York is the kind of place where keeping your home can be so hard mm. that your friendships kind of take a sideline to working that money and staying, you know, keeping your apartment. I'm gonna challenge you to go home tonight, send an email to a friend, 
pick up the phone and call somebody. I'm talking to the millennials and the Gen Zs. <laughs> pick up the phone. Dare to ring somebody on the phone tonight <laughs> and say, I have been thinking about you, and I think our friendship is not in the robust tone I would like to do it, so I would like to change that. Mm. I'd like to see you more. So I am begging you. There's only one way to make community, and it's to be human together. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Erna Broadbow, one of my favorite writers, Jamaican, she always, when she's leaving, she say, come, make us touch flesh because we don't know when the spirit will leave us. You don't know who's going to die. The pandemic has taught you that everyone is going away sometime and that sometimes the leaving is unexpected and it's final and complete and ir like, you know, unchangeable. Yeah. Take the moment to decide who you want your tribe to be, who you want your family to be, who you want your kindred to be. And make an effort to reach out to them and to hold on to them. Some of them don't want to be held. Remember when Harriet Tubman was going down there getting people and they don't want to come, she'd be like, bitch, you come in. <laughs> Sometimes you got to hijack your friend and be like, you're going to be my friend. <laughs> So I am begging you to make the room to be human and to be with your people, to call them kin, to call them kindred, to call them tribe, and to be with them. So I'm going to leave you with that, and I'm going to say big love and gratitude to Tangina and to Michael, who shared the space, and to all the faces that I'm seeing and I recognize and I've seen you through the years. Uh, so much love. Um, come say hi afterwards. It's the last night. Um, you all enjoyed the food? Yes. <laughs> Cheryl's Global Soul. It is on, it is in New York City. Um, it is in uh, Brooklyn on the corner of uh, Underhill and uh, Eastern Parkway. It's mad amazing food. It's Jamaican and made with a lot of love. They provided the food for us tonight. You eat it up. Please find your way over there and pay for one meal. That's also a part of community building. Right. Support your people. Peace, love, and hair grease.